Amen. Thank you, Jane. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's, uh, let's all stand and we'll open our service in prayer. Thank you again for, for being here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this morning and the blessings of the day. Uh, thank you, Lord, for our church family. We pray for those that are away. And um, I want to pray, Father, uh, for Jamelia. I forgot that she got married this weekend. And just thank you for her and for that family and the blessing they've been. And just pray that it would be a special weekend for her. Pray that you would bless this dear family, special family to us. And, uh, and those that are traveling, just Lord, bless Give safety, and we pray for a great day today, great day tonight. Pray that you'd bring uh, those that are on their way safely. Bless those that are online. Uh, help them to be able to give attention to the Word. And uh, Father, I pray that you would have your way. Uh, you use your Word. That is how you equip the saints. That is how you save the lost. And Father, I pray that you would accomplish these things tonight. Uh, guide us. Glorify yourself. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn 492. 492. And that would be, uh, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. There's four verses here, and we'll sing all four unless we really do bad. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others Thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at the throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there, help mine unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face. Heal my wounded, broken spirit. Save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. You may be seated. And again, welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Uh, we're doing things a little different. We did our second song before or after the uh, before the announcements. But here come the announcements. Are you excited about the announcements? These are going to be great announcements. Um, men's con these are the same that we had this morning and for the last couple of weeks. Uh, men's conference, November 10th and 11th. Brochures are on the back table with the registration form. Uh, it's close enough that you don't need to get the, um, the motel, which, which will save you a lot of money. And uh, even if you could just make one day, we would love to have you. It's a great time. Of course, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, the folks that um, were part of our fellowship when we started this church uh, are there. So it's always a blessing. And, of course, the preaching is always good. And I, I, I understand that Ken Lynch is going to be um, 
there. I think he's going to be preaching once, probably doing music as well. But Ken was briefly at the PRBC conference in Wellsboro recently, and I got to meet his wife, his new wife, for the first time. Uh, so he really is married. He was not just pulling our leg. Uh, there is really a human being there, and she's, I think she's going to be with us uh, for our Thanksgiving service. Ken's going to do a little bit of music. We're going to focus again on testimonies that night, uh, but we're looking forward to that. So uh, you're going to get a double dose of Ken Lynch in November. Uh, from our Thanksgiving service and then from the, uh, the men's conference. Uh, Soup and Chili Fellowship is lit, really legit Soup and Chili Fellowship this time, and it's going to be on Sunday, October 29th. Uh, be thinking about what you're going to make and bring. Uh, we always enjoy that, and then we're going to be followed by the panel discussion. And although we have three topics, which probably will fill our time, uh, we're still, anybody that, you know, any, any topics you have, let us know. Those that are online, if you're going to be here for that, or uh, we will be streaming that or doing that Zoom. Uh, feel free to email some topics. And if we don't get to them this, this time, we'll get to them our next panel conference. And then our uh, fourth quarterly business meeting is going to be on October 18th at 7 o'clock. And it'll be here, and it'll be on Zoom. So if you're a member especially, make sure that you're on the, the mailing list. In fact, let me say something about that. Uh, because I've, I've taken over the mailing list for a little bit. And if, uh, especially those of you that are online, if you have not gotten the link these last couple weeks for the Bible study and for the prayer meeting, uh, it is my fault, but I need to know that, uh, that I messed up. Or if you would like to get the link and you have not been getting or you just don't, you have not signed up, uh, you can either text me or you can email the church. I get that. And uh, let me know and we'll send you the link. You can get the link every week. By the way, if you're getting the link and you don't want the link, you can let me know and we'll delete you. We don't want to clutter anybody's mailbox there. Uh, but we would love to have you join us Sunday mornings, our Zoom, two Zooms during the week, our Sunday morning Bible study at 9.30 to 10.30, and then our, our prayer meeting on Wednesday night is from 7 to 8. Uh, they have been a very special blessing as we've changed the format uh, while doing it on Zoom. And it has been a, a big blessing. And we've had people join us, uh, like, our, like our Bible study. What a blessing. Having Howard Hoban with us this morning. He's been joining us a lot. When he moved to New Jersey, we thought, oh, bye, Howard, we're not going to see you. And now he's joining us, and so many people like that. Ravina from Canada, A, uh, has joined us, and um, it's a blessing. All right, we're going to receive our offering at this time. So, men, if you will come. And then, James, I'm going to have you come up to the pulpit and pray for the offering and then go back and take it, okay? Thank you, brother. To worship you together. We pray up for the offerings, Lord. May you bless you, Lord, for your use, for your glory. Thank you for the message, Lord, that we have to receive to through Pastor Lyon this evening. May it be a blessing to you and to us. Thank you again for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Jane. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. What a safe place to be. And I hope you're there tonight. hope you are abiding under the Almighty and hiding in the cleft of the rock. Thank you, Jane. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jane, you need help? Uh, only the last one. Oh, we skipped the first one? Well, no, we did. Didn't we do Glorious Things of the oh, Earth? You, you just switched them around. I thought. How many songs have we sung? One. We sang one song? Yes. <laughs> Jane, of course we're going to do the second song. I would not want you to move from there. <laughs> so which one? You tell me then. Which one are we doing now? We're doing the first one? Glorious Things of the Earth Spoken? Is that right? Okay. Oh my. If there was ever doubt that I was imperfect, I am helping you, giving you ammunition so that I will never be able to claim that I am flawless. All right, let's turn to him four. Okay, and um, let's stand one more time for this one, okay? Him four, glorious things of thee are spoken. We'll sing all three verses. Thank you, Jane. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, form thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, Thou mayest smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living waters springing from eternal love. Well, supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want me mood. Who can faint while such a river Ever flows their thirst to assuage grace which like the Lord the giver never fails from age to age. Round each habitation hovering see the cloud and fire appear for a glory and a covering Showing that the Lord is near, thus deriving from their banner, light by night and shade by day, safe thy feet upon the manna which he gives them when they pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Jane, for staying your full time here. And let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 6. Now, uh, just keep me in line here. We did not have Scripture reading yet, correct? Okay, good. (laughs) All right, let's let's stand. (laughs) Can we stand for Scripture one more time? All right. Scripture reading, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8 is our text tonight. Uh, I'll read this, then we'll remain standing for prayer. Jeremiah chapter 6. Beginning in verse 1, O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa and set up a a sign of fire in Bethesarim, for evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. The shepherds with their flocks shall come unto her. They shall pitch their tents against her round about. They shall feed everyone in his place. Prepare ye war against her. Arise, let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Arise, and let us go by night. Let us destroy her places. For thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast them out against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. 
Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. May God bless His Word. Please bow with me in prayer. Our God in heaven, we thank You for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank You for those that are joining us. Thank You for those that are online. We pray for uh, many in our church that are away right now or not with us here. Just pray that You'd bless them and give them safe travels and uh, just return them again to us soon. And uh, we pray, Father, for Your encouragement. We pray for those that are uh, shut in, um, for Joanne, for Peg, for David. And we ask You to just minister to them. And some of these other needs, Lord, we pray for Nadia. And we pray for... Um, for Hannah's sister, we just ask you, uh, Lord, to minister to these dear gals. We thank you so much. We pray for those that are grieving. I pray for the Minshaw Rossi family. I pray for the Daly family. I just pray that you would minister your grace to these folks. And uh, Lord, we ask your blessing now upon the word. Help us to magnify you. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And keep Mr. Kerr in prayer as well. All right. Jeremiah chapter 6, we are continuing Jeremiah, and honestly, for a man that had a ministry for this long, you're talking decades to the people of Judah, uh, preaching over and over and over again to people that did not want to hear it. Uh, again, Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet uh, for a reason, and uh, we, we, we have to stand in awe of a man that was given such a... a an impossible mission, not really impossible, but we could say ineffective, but not really ineffective. You know, humanly speaking, all those terms would describe Jeremiah. Humanly, uh, he would be a failure because he failed to make one convert. He failed to convince anybody. But God had a bigger purpose. And, you know, it would have just been, okay, Jeremiah, I'm going to give these people a year you preach to them for a year, and if they don't repent and, and wise up, you're off the hook. But he didn't do that. He sent Jeremiah back, and Jeremiah's message uh, continued. The same message. Repent, or judgment is coming. And he, and he did that through various kings, you know, during, during multiple years. He preached, and he preached, and he preached. And he basically was given the same message from all kinds of different angles, and so today, we, tonight, you know, we're here and we are in chapter 6 and we're already getting things repeated because the message is the same. A uh, little more specific tonight uh, where Jeremiah is taking some themes that, he's already, that we've already looked at in the first five chapters and he's now being more specific and he says, oh, verse six, uh, chapter 6 and verse 1, O ye children of Benjamin, that was Jeremiah's tribe. So, he's going to share some things with his own tribe that he had already shared with the people of Judah, other tribes, and he's going to say some of the same things. And our key verse tonight is our last one, verse 8. So let's real quickly look at it. We'll end on this. But verse 8, eight is the key. Where God says, Be thou instructed. Very specific term that is used there. O Jerusalem. And then here's the key phrase. Lest my soul depart from thee. What does that mean? It's a very, in the Hebrew language, is very strong terminology used here. That God is speaking to Israel. And He's saying basically, listen up. When He says, be instructed, He's, the, the, the root word here is He's saying, receive correction. Learn from this. You are being corrected. I am correcting you with this counsel. Be corrected. Change your ways. Or if you don't, lest my soul shall depart from thee. Again, significant key phrase that we're going to look at. And that phrase is what gives us the title of our message tonight, which is repulsing God. Would you want to repulse God? I certainly would not. Hopefully that's your heart. And I would think that, that God's covenant people, 
the people of Judah, the Jews, would certainly not want to repulse his heart. And yet, that is exactly what happened. And Jeremiah, again, is challenging them. Uh, and, and so we're going to talk tonight about how, how it's possible for someone to be, the term in the Old Testament that's used often is abomination. When something is an abomination to God, it is repulsive to Him. It is so contrary to His character and His manner that, um, much like the New Testament, when I think of the church of Laodicea, kind of similar, similar terminology. I mean, you, you might remember the church in Laodicea, the Lord said, I, will, I wish you were cold or hot. But because you're neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew thee out. And, and we're, we're finding this idea here that there are things that repulse God. And we would do wise to learn from this. That there are things that we could do in our lives that would actually incite God to be repulsed from us. And we don't want that. We desperately need God's power. We desperately need God to work in our lives. And we do not want Him resisting us, but He will as He did the people of Judah. So let's jump in. Uh, let me give you the outline as we just work through these verses. Um, so again, a lot of this is the same, same challenge, but more local, specifically Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah's tribe. And first we see the alarm, that trouble is ahead. And we've already, one of our messages recently in Jeremiah was called had the word alarm in it. Uh, it's a similar message. Uh, and that's verses 1 and 2. Then, uh, in chap then the next one, verses 3 through 5, is the mindset of the enemy. God is actually, through Jeremiah, giving insight to Judah. Like he He's actually telling them, here's what your enemy is planning. Here's, here's what's going on in their mind. Amazing. I mean, this is incredible. That God would give them such insight that... You know, again, you'd think that they would say, wow, this is going to come to fruition. These are things that are going to happen. But it didn't affect them. And then follow, following the last one is verses 6 through 8 is God's reasons. Again, this is all stuff we've covered before in past chapters. But once again, God doesn't have to, but He tells them, this is what I'm going to have to do because here's how what you're doing is affecting me. And I need to punish this. I, I, I can't. I don't have a choice but to punish you if this is left unchecked. So let's just jump right in. Beginning in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 1. It is alarm that trouble is ahead. Very similar to some statements in previous chapters. Verse 1. O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa. Tekoa, by the way, was a village... The, the village actually where the prophet Amos came from, and it was about five miles south of Bethlehem. And uh, there's a play on the word in the Hebrew because Tekoa is very similar, almost exact sounds, uh, with the word in the Hebrew for to blow. And he's saying, blow the trumpet in Tekoa. And, and the idea of a trumpet is a warning. Sounding the warning. Set up a sign of fire at Bathesarim. For evil appeareth out of the north. Here we go again. We have the enemy coming from the north. God's telling them this. And who knows at this point because they don't have... Remember, it's not chronological. So they're not exactly sure you know, when during Jeremiah's ministry he was preaching this. But there is a possibility that they were right at the door. And this, you know, this could have been part of Jeremiah's last ditch effort to say, they're here, they're knocking on our door. And... Um, and so the, the challenge is there. Now look at verse 2. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. I have li and, and what's going to happen now, he's, he's about ready to set the scene. Again, he uses figurative language. He's going to talk about shepherds that come in. And, and actually, sounds like a quite peaceful scene in the next few verses. The shepherds come in and they camp around the daughter Zion, this woman, this beautiful woman they're talking about. Uh, but when you read the context and read what he's saying, this is not a, um, a peaceful scene of shepherds and sheep. The shepherds that are camping around the, the, this city are the enemy. 
the, the enemy getting ready to fight. Uh, but notice in verse 2, and I want to make a comment on this. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Now, uh, kind of connecting with our Bible study in the morning, the King James translators incu- included marginal notes. And, and they also included a preface which gives some explanation and some defense of their use of marginal notes. In fact, let me read to you part, part of that right now. Because Miles Smith addressed the problem that could happen because of marginal notes. In other words, if someone's reading their Bible, and then they look at a marginal note, and it says, now you know that word right there might be actually this. Here's what he says. Some peradventure would have no variety of sense set in the margin, lest the authority of the Scriptures for deciding of controversies by that show of uncertainty should be somewhat shaken. In other words, people could read it. They knew this. And yet they did this anyway. They put thousands of marginal notes in the King James translation because they were more interested in integrity than having a show of certainty where there were some words and verses they weren't as sure about. That would horrify some people today. That, that would dare to even correct the King James translation when the King James translator said, correct us. They welcome that. So, listen, in the margin of this verse, Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, next to the word comely, and by the way, comely, there's another aspect, is that English has changed over the years. Uh, when you think of comely, don't think of homely, because the word is speak, that word is speaking beautiful, lovely. But, here's the thing, in the Hebrew, when they wrote that word comely, they weren't exactly sure because it was another word that that it could have been. And so here's what they put in the margin. They they put in the margin the word comely, which shares, they're going to talk about that, and then they put, or dwelling at home. What? Dwelling at home and comely or beautiful are not the same thing, are they? One commentator who was of the same ilk as the King James translators made this statement. He said, this passage, Jeremiah 6.2, is one of the most difficult in this book. And then he says, here's what the most, you know, the generally adopted rendering is. He said, the context, however, seems to favor the rendering pasturage including the idea of a nomad settlement. In other words, the word comely, they said, could also be dwelling at home, the idea of a nomad. Now those are two very different things, are they not? So, here's again what the King James translator said. They said, it has pleased God in His divine providence here and there to scatter words and sentences of that difficulty and doubtfulness. They're talking about this word being one of them. That, and they're telling us, listen, we're not sure that we're putting the right word. But, in fact, they go back on that previous statement. Some peradventure would have no variety of sense to be set in the margin, lest the authority of Scripture for deciding of controversies by a show of uncertainty should be somewhat shaken. In other words, they know that if they put marginal notes that are alternate than what they translated it, that that could get some people to think, oh no, their faith in the Scriptures would be shaken. And so for that very reason, people had the attitude, you know, whether you're sure or not, just just come up with something and put it there dogmatically. And you know what they said about that? They said very clearly, we we hold their judgment not to be so sound in this point. The King James translators rejected that idea and rejected a lot of people who claim to be defending the King James Version, but in actuality are repudiating it because they have canceled the very translators themselves and their philosophy. And I am very against cancel culture, as you know. And that includes the people that have canceled the philosophy of the King James translators. So they said, we disagree with you. Now here's where Miles Smith goes on. It's pleased God in His providence here and there to scatter words and sentences of that difficulty and doubtfulness, not in doctrinal points that concern salvation, for in such it hath been vouched the Scriptures are plain, but in matters of less moment or less importance. What? 
Mr. King James translated, you're saying that there are scriptures that are of less importance? What are you, what are you, crazy? No, that was their philosophy. That's why they put marginal notes in there. And then, in fact, he said uh, th that fearfulness would better beseem us than confidence. This is so going against the attitude of some who criticize any preacher that stands up there and dares to say, this word might be better translated, like that's the greatest heresy. The translators encouraged you to do that. Not undermining the word of God, but understanding how God gave us a word. And then he finalizes with this. In such a case, like Jeremiah 6, 3, or 2, I would add, doth not a margin do well to admonish the reader to seek further and not to conclude or dogmatize upon this or that preemptorily? And so they're telling us, hey, study it out. If there are things we weren't sure of, he, he, take it. He says, he was basically in this area talking about that translation is not a finished work. Pursue it further. And I, I, I thought of this today as I was looking over to tonight, tonight's message. In our Bible study this morning, we had an interesting time. And we were looking at the King James translation and, and asking, what translation did Paul use? Do you know that Paul would quote from the Old Testament and he would use more than one translation? And we saw an example of that was Deuteronomy 25 and verse 4. And uh, Thea read it. And uh, thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the... Well, ours has, ours has corn. Thea's had grain. John's had grain. Uh, in fact, that was a change in there I wasn't even expecting. But we were looking at when Paul quoted that verse in... 1 Timothy 5.18 and 1 Corinthians 9.9. 9. And it was clear he was translating, he was reading from a different translation because the words are different in each one. Still the same point. And this is, this is why I love what Tala Allah said at the point. This is the key. Tala Allah made the point when we were discussing all this, you know. He said something to the effect that, you know, let's go back. What was the main point? Communicating. And that's the bottom line. Satan wants us to get, you know, picking and, and, and getting us distracted from what the Scriptures are saying. And, and I won't comment on that one, Deuteronomy 25.4, though that's got some interesting things there. But let's comment on Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Whether it was a, a comely and beautiful, delicate woman, or whether it was, and, and this is where, if, if it was that alternate that was in the margin most theologians are like, if that's what it was translated, I don't know how that fits in the context. Uh, and they're right. But the bottom line is, what is the text saying? And the picture is that the people of Judah, specifically of Bethlehem, are getting ready to be attacked. And now, let's move on now, because we, we find, verse 3, here's the picture that could be interpreted as a peaceful tranquil picture but it is not the shepherds with their flocks shall come unto her they shall pitch their tents against her round about they shall feed everyone in his place oh isn't that nice mind you of psalm 23 the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures and you've got all these wonderful shepherds with their sheep surrounding judah only one problem the shepherd and the sheeps are an enemy army that are setting up to come and attack. Look at verse uh, 4. Prepare ye war against her. Okay, we have moved the sweet, beautiful, peaceful analogy of the shepherd, and now we're giving some teeth to what's being said. This is, a, this is a, you know, a, an enemy coming in, planting all around Judah, ready to attack. Prepare ye war against her, and let us go up at once, or at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Arise, and let us go up by night, and let us destroy her palaces. So what's happening here? The terminology. Here's, by the way, this was common in Near Eastern uh, religion, or, um, warfare. That it was very common. Most battles and most wars had a timeline because they were very much more than we are they were very much limited to daylight sunrise you know and, and so they wouldn't fight at night generally 
they would start their battles early in the morning so they had all day to fight. And then when the darkness settled in, they would all stop fighting and, and that's when they would rest. It reminds me of some scenes in the Civil War. The Angel of Mary Heights and that guy, that it was, it was that scene, it was at night time when the, war had, the fighting had stopped and that one sole person went out to try to bring relief to some of those people. But here we've got this and here's, this is interesting. This hasn't happened yet, but the God of heaven, the omniscient God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is giving some intel on what is going on in the enemy camp. Here's what they're saying. Prepare ye war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. We want to we get started here. And then, woe unto us, for the day goeth away. So, the plan is, you know, they wanted to start like they normally did, early and fighting, but the day was slipping away. The shadows of the evening are stretched out. And again, that would be a time when you do not start war. But this army was so ready to do battle that their attitude was, look at verse 5, Arise! In other words, get up! And let us go by night. Let us destroy her palaces. Let us prepare for battle. That's, that's what was being said. That's amazing. First of all, Jeremiah, the prophet of God, was giving them intelligence, information that they had no way of knowing. You know, this reminds me very much of the prophet Elisha when it came to the Syrian army. Do you remember this one? This is in, and don't turn there, but I'll, I'll relate it and I'll read some. But it was in 2 Kings chapter 6. We talked about this not too long ago. But it says here, this was um, in the text. It was right after um, Naaman. No, who was the guy that the 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 captain of the Syrian guard that had leprosy? Uh, it was Naaman, the captain of the guard. Okay, uh, he got he got um he got leprosy, and then Jeremiah healed him, and then it went to his servant, and that whole thing. And then it seems like it goes right into this story here. But from the timeline and the, the history, and those that have studied. It seems like there was a big gap of time to when this happened. The king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. So this is the war room here of the enemy, the Syrians. The king, some think it's Ben-Hadad, some think it's Aram, two different Syrian kings at different times. Um, but he's discussing, he's doing war against Israel, and uh, he's saying, okay, he's, you know, imagine the table like they've, I don't know if they did this. You ever see the war room tables where they have a big map and then they have their little pieces and they're planning where the different troops are going to go and all. And you, you imagine that. And in verse 9 it says, And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, and that was uh, King Joram. And so they know that, and that was, so that was significantly after king, of Naaman's time. And so God sent, the man of God, that's the prophet Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. This is, I love this. The prophet Elisha is giving intel to the king of, Eri, uh, of, of Israel as if he was in that planning war room with the king of Syria. It's like he's like, okay, you're planning on this. I'm going to go tell the king of Israel. And so not once, not tw three, at least three times, the king of Syria is ready to do battle. They got their intelligence, and all of a sudden, the, Israel's not there. And it was so frustrating to the king of Assyria that he said this. It says, Verse 11, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore, sore troubled for this thing. I'll bet he was. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He thought, we've got a spy. No doubt one of my generals here is leaving this room and telling the king of Israel. He was convinced of it. Can you blame him? You can't blame him because he was getting his intelligence you know, Elisha was getting intelligence not because he was a fly on the wall or he had some drone or some, uh, you know, bug, electric bug, you know, peep, listening in on it. 
he, he was connected to the omniscient God of heaven who was feeding him information. And then so the, this, this servant girl in verse 12, and one of the servants said, no, my Lord, there's no spies. None of these, nobody has betrayed you. He says, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. I love that. And then, of course, now he realizes, oh, it's Elijah. And so he sends his troops to go get Elijah. And you remember that? I love that scene too. When it's Elijah and his servant and the entire Syrian army are, are like the, the, the vast landscape was the Syrian army against one prophet. And, uh, and, and the prophet's uh, servant or whatever saw that and just literally panicked. Help, Lord, what shall we do? And, and Elisha, you remember that very calmly. It's like, hey, those that are with us are greater than those that are with them. What are you talking about? And then Elisha prayed that God would open his servant's eyes. And for just a moment, the servant saw that the entire mountainside was surrounded by chariots from God. This mighty host that was going to do battle for them. And, and, and boy, what a, what a comfort to us to realize, folks, that God is, there's a spiritual battle, there's a spiritual war going on, but our God is in charge. And so let's get back to this text now. Here in Jeremiah, and uh, verses 3 through 5, uh, you know, it is amazing because just like the prophet Elisha was able to feed information to the king of Israel, so they would know the plans of the Assyrians before they did anything. So the prophet Jeremiah is now letting the very victims themselves, the people of Judah, the people of Bethlehem, the people of that area of Jerusalem, he was letting them know exactly what the enemy was saying. And, what, you know, exactly. They, they're like, they, he's basically saying they wanted to attack earlier. They are chomping. They're ready to go. They're, you know, they really want to fight you, but the time's slipping away. But there's a lot of them that are about ready to attack you at night. And what an incredible thing. Now, just as the king of, of Syria was alarmed, how, are, how is he finding this out? So the people of Israel, the people of Judah, should have also been alarmed. Like, wow. How does, how does Jeremiah know this? He's telling us things that it's as if he knows that it's going to happen. And it would happen. Unfortunately, you remember their response earlier. God's not doing this. this is, Jeremiah, this is not what God's doing. And it very much was. So verse 3, again through 5, Arise, let us go. And now we go to God's reasons. Verse 6 through 8. Again, very similar to what we've been reading. He's, he's sharing with us different analogies to say what's going to happen. He's letting us know the enemy's being lined up. And remember God's foreign servants? He's, gonna get, he's already going to get these enemy kings to come in and, and chasten God's people. And now we read in verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, uh, the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is wholly oppressed in the midst of her. This is, by the way, tactics of siege warfare. They're talking about battering rams, uh, approaching the weaker parts of the wall. Uh, the fall of the city was inevitable. Uh, and, and this kind of goes back a reflection on the foreign servants. You know, that God is, is kind of now, again, going back to giving some instruction to the, the army, which would be Nebuchadnezzar. And look at verse 7 now. Here's why God is going to do what He has to do. As a fountain casteth out her waters. The idea is of a fresh spring or a fresh well that is gushing forth fresh, sparkling, cold water. So she, that's the people of Israel, Judah. So she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. 
And the idea of grief is, is uh, the Hebrew term that's used uh, is, is the term that speaks of the focus. The idea is that it, it's sickness is another word that could be used. But look again at verse 7. As a fountain casteth out her waters, just like a fountain spores, spews forth fresh water, so she, that's the Jews, that's Judah, casteth out her wickedness. So she's not spewing forth fresh water. She's spewing forth wickedness, violence, and spoil. Devastation is the idea. Is heard in her. This is interesting. What God is telling us is, here's, here's, my, here's how I see it. I hear a cry. I hear something. By the way, do you remember in Genesis chapter 18 and 19? God heard the cry from another city. And in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 20, it says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, same terminology, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come up to me, and if not, I will know. Now that's peculiar because God's hearing the cry. God is omniscient. Why would God say, I'm going to go down and check this out? It is not a fact-seeking mission. God already knows exactly what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But He is doing this by way of basically communicating to people that I'm about ready to take action. And in my thoughts, my next step is to kind of do an official investigation just so all the truths are laid out. I already know what they're doing. I already know what they're guilty of. The cry has been coming up to me. That's interesting. Let's go back here now to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 7. She casts out her wickedness, violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Folks, God hears the wickedness of people. People groups. In fact, we've learned in the past that God judges nations in the here and now. He judges individual souls in the afterlife on Judgment Day. But He judges nations right now. That's why the nations of the past, uh, some of them are no longer because God judged them. Now the people of those nations will stand before God and answer to God individually. But God deals with nations differently and here, he is dealing with Judah and, and their wickedness. It's like they're crying up to heaven. All their, they're, they're, they're crying out for judgment. God, judge us. They're not really doing that. But the holy God of heaven who created the earth and blessed them, all nations, pagan and not pagan, when they violate and do things that are repulsive in his sight, he must act to judge sin. God is a holy God, and He will punish sin. Now that is true for individuals on Judgment Day. That is, we will stand before God individually, but folks, He cannot allow the sin of a people, of a nation, of a country, to go on indefinitely. He is too holy for that. Now, now we get to verse 8. Be thou instructed. The Hebrew word is interesting. In fact, one of the Jewish translations in the Tanakh of this is be thou instructed. Uh, other translations put be thou uh, disciplined. But the idea is of be thou instructed is not just, hey, I want to give you some information. Okay? Take it in. I want you to take it in. No, the idea is I want to bring you some correction. I want to correct you. And, and so the challenge is, again, remember, this is God would not punish His people as far as dooming them. Remember, uh, He would say, this, do not bring this to an end. He still had plans for the Jews. But they were going to be disciplined by being for, in 70 years in captivity, Babylonian captivity. But now, He is challenging them 
And he wants them to be corrected. He wants, in other words, they've still got a chance. Even if the enemy was right there, right camping outside, because of this, they still have a chance. Be thou instructed. Please allow me to correct you. He's saying, O Jerusalem. And then here's this phrase. Lest my soul depart from thee. The Hebrew word that is used here is very strong. And the idea is literally and like violently to tear itself away. To, to be wrenched from something. Forcible separation. And so this is what God is saying. Please be corrected. Please change your way. Lest my soul is torn from you. In other words, it, you, you see this. God is not a God that has pleasure in wickedness. Psalm 5 and verse 4 and 5 say, Neither shall evil dwell with thee. But the God of heaven also says, in Ezekiel 33, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way. So we see this dilemma in just this last verse, Jeremiah 6, 8. God wants them. He's giving them maybe their last chance. And he's saying, please, Receive this correction. Please be corrected. Lest my soul be ripped apart from you. Because what you're doing, the idea is, I am repulsed. Because of my holy nature, God is saying. Because I am so holy. Sin cannot be in my presence. You are forcing me to be ripped apart from you. What an amazing thing. This is very strong language recently came across some quotes that have been a help to me uh, as far as this idea of, um, of boundaries in relationships. And somebody, somebody said this in, in, the book, in a book. Allowing someone access without, out, without accountability will eventually lead to abandonment. And this is uh, in relationships. That when you allow someone access without any accountability... It's going to lead to abandonment of one party to the other or the one other party to the other. That, that's what happens in relationships. And that's exactly what's happening here in, in Israel. You know, they entered in a covenant relationship and they are not living by the covenant. They are living an abomination before God. They're repulsing God and they are, they are forcing God to judge them. In fact, remember the verse we looked at? I think it was just last week. It was Jeremiah 2.25. Your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholden good things from you. Don't blame God. And folks, by the way, on Judgment Day or when God judges a nation, if America soon gets what it seems to deserve, it will not be God's fault. There will be many people that will try to blame God no doubt, but it will not be God's fault. Uh, we have, America clearly has just become an abomination to God. We are provoking a holy God. And I encourage you to read Thea's blog this week. <laughs> um, another, another quote here with this, this book I was reading. Unchecked misuse of a relationship can quickly turn into abuse. That is true. And then, then the writer said this, and this is a good point, made me think of Jeremiah immediately. Like God, we must require from people the responsibility necessary to grant the amount of access we allow them in our lives. So irresponsible people, while God loves them, He loved the Jews through this whole thing, that's, if you doubted that, all you need to do is say, Jeremiah, come here for a minute, stand front and center. His very existence was a demonstration that he loved the Jews and he wasn't giving up on them. But, again, like God, we must require from people the responsibility necessary to grant the amount of access we allow them to have in our lives. And folks, Jeremiah 6 and verse 8, God is saying, you need to change, you need to be corrected, because what you're doing is repulsive to me, and lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. That's the challenge. That is their exhortation. I close with this. 
Um, I looked up, I uh, found an article, and, and I won't read it all, but uh, it caught my attention. Uh, it's called 20 Things That Can Make You Sick. And it tells you everyday things that you touch that can make you sick. And you don't even realize it. And I could, I'll, give, I'll go into detail on one or two of them uh, because it will ruin your day. It will ruin your next trip to the keyboard on the computer will have a whole different meaning. Your next trip to the kitchen to use the sponge will have a different meaning. 20 things that can make you sick. Number one, bed sheets. Believe it or not, your bed sheets are a breeding ground for dust mites. They can live, die, and reproduce in your bed. Feasting on your dead skin cells. As they do, they can affect your allergies and lower your immune system. <laughs> Sorry, you won't be able to go to sleep tonight. You'll be thinking about those bed bugs. Pillows, same thing, more detail. Toothbrushes, cosmetics, I'm, I'm, doorknobs, light switches, refrigerator handles. You pull out the bacon to make breakfast. You pull out the lunch meat to make a sandwich. You pull out the chicken to make dinner. But how often do you wash your hands before you put it back? If you don't do it every time, your refrigerator handles could be contaminated with the same bacteria as the raw meat. Gross! Kitchen sponges. You think you're cleaning your dishes, but you might just be transferring bacteria from one place to another. Apparently sponges are breeding grounds for bacteria. That's pretty gross. Buffets, I'm not going to read that because we're planning on going to a buffet soon with my father-in-law and, and I don't want to ruin it so I'm just going to pretend one, that one's not there. Water pitchers, vending machines. Here's one. Caramel apples. I haven't had caramel apples since I was younger on Halloween. I mean, um, out of season produce, grocery carts. Listen to this one. A study at the University of Arizona showed that almost 100% of grocery carts are contaminated with E. coli. Isn't that nice? Here's the last one. Keyboards is another one. I won't go into that because of time. And then parking meters. Here's the last one. Money. The smaller the value, the dirtier it can be. Bills like 20s, 30s, and 10s, and 5s, and 1s Pocket change are used far more often, which means they handle hands more frequently. And then, they, of course, they've tested them, and there's, there's so much. Listen, there's so, your money is so contaminated. You know what? We're going to take an offering and just collect it from you so that you don't have to get your hands dirty. <laughs> I'm kidding. But you know what? There are things, folks. You know, I just read this hoping to maybe repulse you a little bit. But it definitely gets you thinking, you know, I don't want to get germs, but I want to tell you something that our God is so holy that because he was in a covenant relationship with his people, their actions affected him. Remember that word, the idea of the um, that term that's translated in verse 8 to be repulsed or that, that gives that meaning. Be thou instructed, lest my soul depart from thee. My soul is ripped away from you because you have become an abomination, is the idea. Because your actions are repulsive. As much as I love you, I have to limit access. And he was going to, if they would not be corrected, he was going to discipline them 70 years. And that's what would happen. So, what's the takeaway for us? Folks, understand. That there are things, and God, He doesn't hide it. He, it. We're not like, man, I wonder I wonder what it is today that Christians do that would repulse God. Hmm, I don't know. No, God has made it very clear that there are some things that you and I could do that would repulse God and very much affect our relationship with Him. But folks, by the way, God gives us grace to get rid of every one of those things in our life. He is so powerful that He can enable us. Once you realize, it, you have to first realize, I'm repulsing God. This activity that I do or I'm involved in is repulsing God, so He can't bless me. And you have to realize that before you start asking for His help. Then we need to ask His help. And, and our God is awesome. He's abundantly able to do 
above all that we ask or think. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these dear folks. Thank you for any that are joining us online, maybe the one or two that are still online. Uh, Lord, bless, bless the application of this. Help us to learn that you are so holy, that there are things that repulse you. And Lord, help us to even care. So many people, they just do not even care that, that they are offending you. They, they just they deny your existence. But Father, we care. And we ask you to help us to live by your grace in a manner that is pleasing to you. We ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's take out, let's all stand. Thank you for your patience. And let's take our hymn books and let's close. And I know that we are on the closing song. No doubt about it. Let's turn to hymn 503. And we are going to sing. Uh, the first and the last verses of Moment by Moment, verse 1 and 3. Dying with Jesus by death reckon me, living with Jesus a new life divine. Looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O Lord, I am Thine. By moment I'm kept in His love. Moment by moment I fly from above. Looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. Verse 3. Never a weakness that he doth not feel. Never a sickness that he cannot heal. Moment by moment, I trust in the will. Jesus, my Savior, abides with me still. By moment I'm kept in His love. Moment by moment I fly from above. Looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O Lord, I am Thine. Amen. You are dismissed.